relationships building requires trust, time, and transparency. So trust, time, and transparency. And, it, and you know that if you actually know, think of your own relationships in your own life. Put aside organizational relationships, governmental relationships, institutional. Think just about your personal relationships for a moment. Do you have a relationship with people you can't trust, who, who you don't share time with, and that you're not transparent with? Typically not. Typically we don't have deep relationships with people that don't we don't share those things with. And that is true also of um, organizations and institutions. If there isn't trust, and if there isn't time, and there's transparency, it's unlikely communities will think of those places as places where they belong, institutions or, or structures where they should be. Um, so build those relationships. Be consistent in your relationship building. And what I mean by that is that um, don't – you need to be there not all the time, strictly being, but consistent. And you need to be in that relationship communicating with um, – the communities that you want to engage with, that you want to invite in, um, is you need to do be engaging with them when you don't want something from them, when you when you're not asking for anything. Because I think one of the barriers that often comes up, and I know this in organizations I've worked for, is they want to engage a specific community, and they really only think of it when they have a specific their need. They have a specific need from that community, whether that's attendance, money, whatever it may be, uh, and that's when they begin that engagement. But communities see through that. You know, if, if you've only come when you're asking at an hand and you're not there the rest of the time, I don't think the trust, the time, or the transparency is there uh, for that relationship to necessarily go where you want it to go. So start building the relationships with the communities um, that's how you will open what I call the, 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 the sort of flood of, of people inside. Um, it's very difficult to do from top down. You need top down buy-in in organizational structures for diversity measures, but typically the flood of inclusion comes uh, lower down than up on the top. So relationships must come, for, come first. Um, uh, Trust, time, and transparency, and be consistent in your relationships. And live in what we would call right relations, which means reciprocal benefit, um, and you're always aware of, of, of um, what the other wants, and put everything on the table. It's, it's, no one has time to hide things. Just be, be up front, but build your relationship, and be in it for the long haul. This is the other thing. It's not a momentary thing. This, this activity that you're going to engage in, is not going to occur over a quarter or two quarters or a fiscal year. It's a long-term project, so engage like it, it requires long-term engagement and a long-term relationship. Uh, second is, uh, and we hear this a lot, and th even this session sort of acts as a, as a bit of this, which is um, that when we come to diversity and inclusion work, uh, a lot of the time it's framed as a time to listen and learn. And it is true that education is key to understanding. Uh, it's key to building empathy. It's key to breaking down the barriers um, that exist between communities where those relationships are getting caught up. But I think, and this is where I, I said, I, I approached this slightly different from even a year ago, is while you're listening and learning, realize that the communities that are seeking entry, that are seeking equity, seeking uh, equality for Indigenous people, seeking sovereignty. Um, we don't really want to wait for everyone to have to listen and learn. It's a very valuable, and, and, and many of us are willing to put in that effort. But while, while organizations and listening are learning, people are still on the outside, people are still hurting, um, people are still being harmed. So we need to listen, learn, and act on what you're listening and learning. And you may even need to do those things at the same time, that while you're listening and learning, you need to also act. Um, uh, progress needs to happen simultaneously to the education that is going on. Don't fear being imperfect. I think 
This is something that we see all the time when change is occurring. And I think this is especially true in this moment when it comes to issues of inclusion and diversity and equity and equality and, and uh, racial equity and social justice is suddenly there's a fear that if you don't get it right, that you'll be criticized, which is true. You probably will. Um, and this often actually causes a, a stasis where organizations or people don't do anything for fear of getting it wrong. And frankly, if you're going to listen and learn and then not act, you're not actually totally living in right relations with someone like me who's doing this work, who's asking you to do more than just listen and learn. Uh, so, so we all make mistakes. It may not be perfect. You, if you build, if you've built a relationship, if you've listened, if you've invited that community in, and if we, when we get to the next the big thing, we'll talk about that. If you've done taken those steps to have a meaningful engagement, and actually invite people into this process, then you don't actually have to fear being imperfect. Because if you do something that isn't exactly right, that relationship will guide you to repairing it. That relationship is what will make it better. Uh, and so don't fear. Don't let fear get in the way of actual progress. Because, again, we don't have, we don't honestly have time for that. And the last point I'll make is something that I advocate as, as part of my daily job, which is data or data, however you want to say it, is your friend. Um, and what I mean is that in Canada, when it comes to diversity and inclusion, we have a really unfortunate and challenging uh, data uh, divide, data gap, meaning that we really have not collected for example, race-based data uh, in almost any field at all. Uh, and this presents a problem when you're trying to do in inclusion and diversity work. If you don't actually know what your baseline is, what are your success metrics if you don't know where you're coming from? And I think part of the issue is that data collection in this area is, is not easy. It's a challenge. There's there's protocols and processes and best practices that really need to be here too. And frankly, all of those things are a moving, evolving thing. So, so what is best practice last year may not be best practice the next year. So you, you have to evolve your data collection and what that actually looks like and how you go about containing it. Um, and I think there's also a fear of what that data will show right now. Uh, and so, because we are, frankly, we sort of know what it's going to show, and that is that a lot of organizations, institutions, and governments in Canada are not diverse and not inclusive. The, 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 there are not broad-based communities represented within them, and there's a fear of admitting that. Um, but as, as someone who comes from a community who's often advocating uh, around being, I wouldn't say, actually, we don't advocate for inclusion or diversity necessarily we advocate for sovereignty when you're first nations um because because i should point out we don't necessarily want to be included in colonialism we, we want back what we had before um which is we can get to to the differences there but the point is if you don't collect data if and if you're too afraid of what that data will show it's going to be very hard for you to understand where it is that you need to do the work what success actually will look like uh, in that work, and um, you need to set those benchmarks. So that is your friend. Try to collect uh, as much data as you possibly can. And then the last point, frankly, I think is actually the, the most important point, and it's maybe the one where the fear comes from a, from many people, which is that none, no, no diversity or inclusion work matters without a sharing of power. Power is, uh, for better or worse, I would perhaps say mostly worse, but power is the, the largest commodity that in time that we have, and yet it's, there's no, there, there, it's not a currency. Um, and, you know, I, I will often say, for example, that we don't actually live in a, in a country or a society of the rule of law. We live in a society and culture based entirely on access to power. And if you're powerful, you don't actually have to obey that many laws. We see that all the time. So it's not a law, rule of law thing if you have power. Um, and in institutions, 
uh, who are looking to engage, who find themselves not being able to meet this moment, um, who's not who's not necessarily being able to adapt, who, who find themselves not being necessarily diverse or inclusive, it actually won't, you won't achieve those goals if you don't share power. So things like diversity committees, uh, indigenous committees or circles, things that are adjacent to your governance structure, your org structure, that the basically where the power lies, but don't actually have power, um, they're, they, they are going to be tools of frustration. You will, the people on the committees, and as someone who sits on many of them, has sat on many of them, and have resigned from many more, uh, will become exceedingly frustrated if their recommendations aren't actually followed through because they don't have power. Um, uh, and the organization um, has no incentive to actually empower committees and those sorts of um, adjacent bodies or adjacent to the governance structure. So you actually need to share power, meaning you need to have people from communities who have real power and authority within your organization. You need to not only empower them, listen to them, uh, support them, and be open to the change that they're going to be uh, advocating for. But my other point was allow yourself to be changed. And this is the other part is that so often what happens with these initiatives is that you'll hire one or two people, maybe you'll hire a diversity officer or a diversity and inclusion officer. There will be a person of color. They'll come from a marginalized community. They'll be the only person doing the work in the organization. Uh, there won't be a ton of support, and when they act, when they confront real places in need of change within the org, activities that need to stop or alter, uh, structures that need to be changed or torn down, they they'll hit a wall. That 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 is that is a bridge too far, and though that's when those initiatives will fail, and when relationships actually that you may have been trying to build will begin to be broken. Because the, the trust wasn't there, the transparency there, and the power wasn't there to uh, share or to abdicate. And uh, ultimately, that's that's the biggest thing that organizations, all of the governments, institutions, is to acknowledge that power is at the center of why there's a need for diversity and inclusion, why there's exclusion, is because for many years, People were hoarding power and still hoard power. And um, unless we share that, it's going to be very hard to reach the the uh, other metrics that you may want to reach. And to especially reach that organic style of diversity and inclusion that occurs in natural ecosystems. Your company and business can be that, but it has to be a very open place. It has to be a, a place where everyone can find themselves comfortable, can see themselves there, can navigate it as a, as, and not be, be harmed, can live in right relations. And once that happens, the communities will come to you because they will understand that, that there's a safe place for them, that the trust has been built up over years, that this is their place as much as it is, as it is yours. Um, but if that isn't true in this moment, then that tells you how much work has to be done to get to that really organic diversity and inclusion that I think is really what most people desire. Because, frankly, even the term diversity and inclusion is still suggestive of power, that somewhere someone is deciding to be diverse or, or diversify. Someone is deciding who gets to be included and who doesn't. We can't have that. And so ultimately we need to see a sharing of real power and an authority within organizations. And that is, can be very scary, but ultimately that this will is strengthen and make your organization and your, your, your company or your government more able to be sustainable, more able to be engaged and more able to withstand crises in the long term than institutions that don't have that diversity, don't have that experience, don't have that knowledge already embedded with them. So the next time we're faced with a COVID crisis, the next time we're faced with this sort of 
world-changing event, you will have the expertise, the community will already be in your organization and ready to withstand it, as opposed to putting all of that on the weight, weight of a few shoulders. Uh, I think I'm going to end there, uh, Teresa and uh, team. And uh, if you have questions or comments or whatever, um, you can put them in the chat function and we'll we'll do that. So miigwech, 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 chi miigwech for listening. Thank you, Jesse. Um, <clears throat> a really thoughtful uh, approach to the topic and um, and what our audience has been uh, looking for. So uh, much appreciated. And uh, indeed, we've got um, quite a few good comments in the chat and overall um, appreciation for the content that you are providing um, and, uh, and just uh, having the opportunity to learn from someone like you. So thank you. Um, I can see a few specific questions, so we'll go to those. Um, and you may have touched on some of them in the presentation, but looking for uh, a bit of expansion. Um, a question about how can organizations with uh, predominantly white people uh, create a safe, inclusive space for uh, BIPOC uh, members of the organization, Black, Indigenous, people of color? Uh, thank you so much for the the, the question. Um, uh, it's a tough one if you're if you're primor primarily non diverse and you're trying to make a safe space. Um, I, I mean, I think I think we touched on some of it. Is is can you share the power? And more importantly, if it's a if it's a space, or can you just give it up for for a moment? Um, so, for example, I work a lot in the art sector. Um, and so, and, and so I get asked this question all the time. And, uh, what I would often say to an organization is, well, can you give, give the venue to someone else? And I don't mean permanently. I just mean, can you use your, your, um, administrative might as an institution or an organization to allow another community to come in and do what they need to do while you support it and don't actually have a say in what happens or I'll give you an example from my work. Uh, so I run something called the indigenous screen office, which is meant to increase the representation of indigenous people in Canadians, Canada's screen sector and um, advocate for indigenous narrative uh, sovereignty in the screen sector. We just launched something that we call the diversity. Um, uh, uh, no, not the, it's called the solidarity fund and it's a funding program uh, that's for development that we did in solidarity with black and other people of color uh, in this moment. We have, while we're a very small organization, we are incorporated. We do have some staff. So I do have some administrative weight. It's very small, but we do have some weight, whereas a lot of um, similar advocacy organizations don't. They're not incorporated, so they can't actually disperse programming funds like we can. And so what we did is say we will offer our administrative back end to the the black and BIPOC community. They will run the program. They will they will figure out the eligibility, what it is they're funding, all of that. All we will take care of is the administrative side. And so all we're adding is what they don't have, administrative weight. We're not adding any of our opinion of what the program should be who should get it, anything like that, because it's not up to us. And in that way, we're sharing the space for them, uh, allowing them to access our uh, organization. We're building relationships. We're learning in this act, because we're learning as much from, from them, the people we've partnered with, as they are from us. Um, it's been an incredible uh, experience. Um, and to me, that's the idea, is if you run a theater, can you give it up to another theater company for a week or, 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 or so on? That sort of, um, that sort of thing. And then that sort of steps, then build those relationships, hire people, um, make it so the community can see themselves there and they will, they will come, uh, as well. And, and it's, you have to sort of just put in the, the long term work, um, unfortunately, but it's a good place to start of just thinking, what can we share without really having to own it?
is, is really the key. Mm-hmm. That's a, a, I can appreciate that perspective and encouraging people to think about opportunities that they have that they may be able to share with others. And, um, and that relates somewhat to another question about, um, dedicated seats. So there's a question, do you advocate for dedicated seats on corporate boards, for example, for specific groups? So, um, in, in the moment, um, uh, where if you're, so if you're not, if you don't have a ton of representation in the board and, um, you, you're not necessarily have the relationships where you're getting applicants or board nominations that are meeting those desired outcomes, then yes, um, because you'll force yourself to do it. So, um, but I don't think you, once you get moving, you may not need so. But I'll give you a great example. Like um, for women, for example, because I work with a lot of organizations that are seeking gender parity in their activities and in their the way they staff and in their boards, you may have to set a mark saying that we this will be a target and we won't. That's the goal. Um, so I do think um, putting targets and saving seats is important, but you have to be able to fill them. Uh, if they're going to sit vacant, no good. Um, so uh, I, and I think you should be able to evolve out of that. Um, and that's diversity in all always. For example, in the board, you know, in our board policy for the ISO. We have like regional representation because we want because we because we're an indigenous organization that's national to Canada. We recognize that there's multiple nations, um, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis on this land. So we're the, the the board should be comprised of people that aren't just from Central Canada. They need to be a multinational board. Our staff should be multinational. Um, we don't necessarily put targets. But that is in the bylaws and in the policy that, that we strive to uh, achieve that. And that's, again, to live in live in right relations and, and trying actually to conceive of what a national organization for First Nations Métis and Inuit actually looks like since pre-Canada, um, we didn't really do that. Um, so it, it's just trying to imagine that. But I, I do think those can be useful. Uh, in setting a mark that you have to hit and almost forcing yourself to do it. Um, but I think there are some, some pitfalls along the way that you just want to be conscious of. Uh, and I will say that, you know, the board is a good place to start. Um, cause that does send a, a signal. I know that since my appointment to chair of Canada Council, uh, the staff there have reported that, you know, for example, they're getting a lot more Indigenous applicants to their, the jobs they post just since my announcement. And that's good. That, that's a good, you know, that's the community beginning to see that organization as a place that it, where it belongs. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I think those are absolutely good things to, to work for. Those send big signals to communities when they can see that there is a place for them there. Yes, and shows uh, accountability and the building of relationships, uh, as you had touched on. Um, there's a couple of questions along the same lines, so I'm going to summarize it, which is um, for organizations who are um, primarily non-diverse, and especially if you're a BIPOC individual, how do you suggest um, uh, uh, they can bring up discussions around um, a sense that the organization thinks that they are uh, doing diversity well, that it's just performatory, or we don't need to do this in Canada, we're already quite diverse, um, that sort of sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, those are classic uh, sort of um, gaslighting uh, maneuvers. I mean, uh, of course Canada is diverse. Uh, this land was diverse long before Canada was. Uh, this was a multinational place. So the, this place, wh- whether it, when it's called Canada now, but even before and after, um, will always be diverse, always has been diverse. It is, it is, it's a multinational place. Um, so I, I, but that doesn't mean your organization or wherever your workplace is. So the, I, that, that's the whole point of this work, right? Is that, that, um, yes, the country is diverse, your organization is not. And that's the gap you're trying to, Phil, the question of what happens when you're um, BIPOC or racialized or from a marginalized community uh, working in an org and they're 
their their efforts are performative, that is tough. Um, this where the power becomes key because if you have people in positions of power, they can actually influence change. If you don't, then the best course of action that I've seen is to strike committees with your fellow uh, employees, um, and because there's there's strength in numbers, and and it can be quite daunting and scary to bring this if you're an individual, quite risky, let's be honest. Uh, it can be quite risky to do it. Um, uh, and so I think if you can form a committee, I've seen that actually in governments, um, where they'll have a, a, a staff committee will be formed of, say, black uh, staff or indigenous staff, or it could be a BIPOC committee. Um, the key always with those things is if they're built, fill the staff that's better than if they're outside, because at least you have people that have, are engaged with the organization in, in a sort of direct relationship that can influence, but there should really be um, um, some sort of parameters or uh, idea of what, in terms of reference for that committee, so that you actually know what power and influence you have, and you should have some. If, you're, if, if it's just something to do so that they can say they have it, then don't bother. But if, if it can actually have an opportunity to get those comments to them, but not be on an individual basis, that's a great way. I have started to see um, the Toronto Star recently did this as a media organization, and some other places have started to do it, where they actually have an ombudsman specifically for these issues. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Typically a uh, someone senior. And the idea is that gives you a, co a confidential place to raise these issues, and that that ombudsperson can then take it to management or, or the executives or whoever needs to hear it and feel somewhat empowered to, to do so, but keep the confidentiality for staff. Um, that's certainly, I think that's, I, I, I think you need some mechanism where you can surface those issues, but keep the potential harm down for the people that are doing that service, because we have to recognize that it can be a place of harm, and that not everyone, as I have done, can afford to quit their job when, when they see these things happen. Um, and so... I think you need to come up with some mechanisms, whether it's a staff committee or, or committee of um, people that are, are engaged with the organization internally, or have a actually have a staff position that's really not so much about diversity and inclusion as much as fielding those internal issues and surfacing them to the executive and management. Thank you. Very helpful with some specific ideas about how uh, individuals and organizations can make those changes. Um, I know we could keep on talking, but I'm conscious of uh, everyone's time. And uh, so we'll work to um, wrap this up. Thank you so much, Jesse. I have seen uh, continued comments in the chat, including this is one of the best presentations I have seen in a long time. Uh, so <clears throat> your message is being heard. And, uh, and so thankful for everyone who has joined us here today. As Jesse mentioned, um, encouragement for all of us to allow ourselves to be changed. And I think this is a great step by participating in a session like this and bringing some of the ideas back to your organization. So um, I appreciate again, Jesse, your um, recommendations about how to understand some of the barriers to success and your directions for action, including uh, building relationships, education, the value of data, uh, and the importance of sharing of power. Thank you so much uh, to you, Jesse, to our NSB and GSA team, and to our audience. Um, if uh, Jesse is the right speaker for your organization and you want to go deeper, uh, please reach out to us. Uh, we'd love to help um, with your programming and uh, Jesse Wente at your next uh, event or session.